ever since the, the fall of the Berlin Wall and the end of the Cold War, uh, we thought the world was going to be different. We thought the world was going to become, at least some of the most outspoken observers thought that uh, everybody was going to be like us. Well, that turned out not to be the case. Uh, the last couple decades have been one of a rise of new forms of ethnic and religious violence around the world. And I think the two things are related. The era of globalization and the insecurity of the nation state and the kind of rapid social transformation around the world has created uh, the insecurities that produce the new tribalization of religious and ethnic violence in every religious tradition. And so for me, somebody who studied religion and politics for most of my career, the question was, why now and why religion? What does religion have to do with it? And so I became engaged in a whole series of case studies and projects that have led to a, a series of books on the topic, including the most recent one, Global Rebellion, Religious Challenges of the Secular State. But all of this began in the Punjab in India. And it began there because I used to live there. For years I lived in the Punjab in northern India uh, where the Sikhs live. These are people with the long hairs and the tur long hair and turbans. The men uh, cannot wear their hair. And uh, it's a, really a, a wonderful community of people to live with. I don't know whether you know Sikhs, but they're great. Uh, they're outgoing, lively, uh, not like those stuffy Hindus. They're really fun people to be with. I know I'm insulting somebody, but I can't help it. I love Sikhs. So in the 1980s, when an awful spiral of violence began between young Sikh men and the Indian government, led by this man, Sanjanal Singh Binderwali, I wanted to know why. And it was not just an intellectual concern. It was also a personal one. How, how could people that I knew and such lovely, gregarious, and lively people uh, be involved in this vicious spiral of uh, this vicious spiral of violence. So I went back to India uh, to listen to the sermons of uh, Binderal. By the time I got there, he had been killed, but I was able to talk with his followers, to talk with his the people close to him, and look at the tapes. And invariably, I'd see somebody, I, I, I expected to see what we were told, you'll find in such cases, how wily politicians use religion for political purposes. But that's not what I found. Ben Bali was not a wily politician. He was something of a country preacher. And he would come out and he'd look over a sea of invariably young, sick men, usually men, and he'd growl at them and they'd say, look at you, you know, you've given it up. Look at you, you've trimmed your hair and beard, you're wearing shiny shoes and fancy pants, and you're hankering after government jobs and university positions. You've lost it. So what about the, the tough ways of the gurus of your forefathers? There's a war going out there, a battle between good and evil and right and wrong and religion and irreligion. And, and the time has come for you to take up the arm of faith and stand up for what you believe, to follow the path of the forefathers. Well. What an exciting call to action. Who wouldn't be mesmerized by such a thing? And as I listened to those words, I said to myself, you know, I've heard this before. Now, by saying that, I mean, I, did, I didn't, wasn't raised as a sick young man in an Indian village. I grew up in the Midwest in a, very much of a Bible Belt area of southern Illinois near St. Louis. And it was a place, a small town, a little farming community. And during the summer, especially, things got hot and the flies were buzzing. And I can't tell you how incredibly boring life was until the revivals came to town. <laughs> and then suddenly the tent went up and the preachers came out and the gospel singing began. And hallelujah, we began to be excited by the message of the, of the prophet and the prophets and the, and the revivalists. And then we began to be stirred into action. I remember there's one guy dressed in camouflage and army uniform, he would stand up in front of everybody and say, you know, look at you people. You've lost it. You're giving up everything for the easy life. You know, there's a battle going on. There's a war between good and evil and right and wrong and religion and irreligion. And the time has come right now for you to take up the sword of faith and walk down the sawdust path and accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. Hallelujah. And be saved. Well, what a staring call to action. I mean, who of us who leads messy lives, and all of us lead messy lives, wouldn't be attracted to doing something serious with our life, to 
taking up the sword of faith, being really involved to live in a way that's not just giving up to the easy humdrum existence, but it's actually meeting the challenges. So I myself was saved on more than one occasion because, <laughs> because it was an exciting way to be, to be involved in a world where there was something, a war, something bigger than ourselves. Now, I knew it was a metaphor. None of us thought we were going to actually take up a sword and actually going to kill people. But that's what it is in Christianity, right? A metaphor. Uh, not for everybody. There are, you know, groups within the Christian right for whom the idea of the call to battle, the call to picking up the sword of faith is very much a physical act. It is very much an act of violence. And I'm not talking just about the Aryan nation, but there is the Aryan nation. But what about Timothy McVeigh? The guy who blew up the whole front of the Oklahoma City Federal Building, the largest act of terrorism on American soil before 9-11. Now, I, you know, you know, I know you don't think of him as a religious terrorist because it wasn't in the interest of either the prosecution or the defense to portray him that way. But if you look at what was important to him, the, his Bible, the, this, this book that he used to hawk at, at, at gun shows, you'll see that it was uh, the Turner Diaries was all about cosmotheism, this religious vision of a new order of trying to transform the United States, to try to save America for Christian civilization because it was being taken over by a multicultural society of alien people. And it, it, we needed to be wakened up. We needed to be shown that there was a war going on. And so blowing up the Oklahoma City Federal Building was an act of Christian terrorism to try to show us that this war is real. It's a real thing that's happening in the world. Andres Breivik, just a couple years ago in Norway, was doing the same thing. If you look at this manifesto, he talked about how he was trying to do, by this act of violence, exploding bombs in downtown Oslo and going into a youth camp of people associated with the multicultural political society and started killing people, killing young people in, in cold blood. He was trying to, in his mind, stop a progress of multiculturalism in Norway that he thought was undercutting Christian civilization. And he titled his manifesto with a date that harked back to the gates of Vienna where the Muslim armies had been stopped in an earlier point of European history and he thought he was doing the same thing. A Christian terrorist who took this idea of warfare literally, seriously. The attack on the Atlanta Olympics was by Christian identity people who thought that they were bringing about this war. I interviewed a guy who was, had bombed abortion clinics up and down the East Coast and lesbian bars and written a book called A Time to Kill out of Ecclesiastic. He was a Lutheran pastor. Trained as a Lutheran pastor, but he saw the idea of warfare in Christianity as a real thing and thought that the time had come up to, as Ecclesiastes said, it was a time to kill. And he wrote a whole handbook on how to do it. One of his best friends, David Hill, who's a Presbyterian pastor, took his message literally and, and he thought a, book, a passage in scripture had instructed him to mow down some abortion clinic uh, uh, providers as they entered a clinic in Pensacola, Florida, as guards stood around, including the police, watched him in horror as he killed them in cold blood, and then he threw down the gun and said, arrest me. And of course they did, and they took him off to the state of Florida, executed David Hill. Is he a Christian suicide attacker? He knew he was going to be caught and executed. But he took literally the idea of cosmic war. Now the interesting thing is, the very same thinking was involved in some of the people involved in the World Trade Center attack. Now, you all know about 9-11. In 1993, there was another attack on the World Trade Center. In fact, if they had been successful in 1993, the towers would not have come down within an hour or so. They would have come down immediately because they had Ryder rental trucks of, with fuel of, full of fuel oil and fertilizer that were supposed to explode under one of the central columns of one of the towers. And like trees falling in the forest, the first tower would fall in the second tower, the second tower would fall in, into all the buildings within the shadows of those two enormous edifices. If you go to Manhattan today, you'll see that the footprint of the World Trade Center towers are right across the street from very high-rise buildings because 
in, in 9-11, they imploded. And, and after an hour, which allowed thousands of people to escape, I did the calculation that 25,000, 25,000, in either tower, 20, uh, people working there, 25,000, another 25,000 guests, that's 100,000 people in the towers, and this was high noon in 1993, not first thing in the morning, like 9-11. And then another 100,000, 200,000 people would have been killed. So when I first saw 9-11, the television pictures, I thought, have to be tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of people killed. And it was huge relief. I mean, tragic, of course, for the 3,000, under 3,000 who were killed. But what the same group of people were trying to do in 1993 just resulted in this, a big explosion in one of the sub-buildings of the, uh, of, under one of the towers of 9-11. And this was a group of people who were brought to justice and serving prison time right now in the United States in American in Manhattan courtrooms, uh, the same connections with the people who were in fact involved in 9-11. Ramsey Yusuf up there in the upper left-hand corner, he's the nephew of Sheikh Khalid Muhammad, the guy who in fact is the central conspirator according to the 9-11 Commission report in 9-11. You think it's Osama bin Laden, I know, he's become the symbol of it, but it was his uncle, uh, Sheikh uh, um, um, uh, colleague Sheikh Mohammed, and this is his nephew, Ramzi Rousseff, and the fellow down there, Mahmoud Abu Lima, was identified as Time Magazine as the chief conspirator, the organizer. I said, I want to talk with this guy. So I found out where he was, and where was he? Remember, he was tried and convicted. He was 15 miles from my hometown in Santa Barbara, Lompoc Federal Penitentiary. So I said, I want to go to Lompoc to see him, but it took me two years. It's even harder to break into prison than to break out of prison. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to talk with his lawyer. I had to talk with the warden. Ultimately, I got uh, uh, Walter Capps, who was my congressman at the time, to go intercede for me. Uh, and I was able, the only uh, academic or, or reporter for that matter, the only person to have interviewed Apolima, Lima, which I did on several occasions. And what was a very interesting set of interviews. As I believe he was a very friendly, friendly, outspoken guy you know, with a kind of gregarious called Mamu the Red because he's kind of had red hair, Egyptian background. And, it, you know, it was, I don't know what you think a terrorist is, but he didn't look like a terrorist. He didn't talk like a terrorist. He'd say, damn this shit, this, you know. And, he, you know, he had a penchant for blonde Norwegian women. But when it came to the subject of religion and politics, his eyes kind of darkened and he kind of hunched over and he said, Mr. Mark, he says, you people don't get it. He says, you're just like sheep. He says, your government is fooling you. It's tricked you. You don't understand what's going on in the world. Your newspapers don't report anything. Your government is trying to hide the, hide the information for you. Mr. Mark, he said, there's a war going on. There's a battle between good and evil and right and wrong and religion and irreligion and your government is the enemy. He says, the problem with you people, you sheep, you need to be shaken awake. You need to be grabbed by the shoulders and shaken so you know what's really happening in the world. And I said, is that the reason why people bomb buildings? And he just looked at me and smiled and he said, well, now you know. <laughs> After 9-11, of course, now we all knew. For him, this pervasive image of cosmic war, the great battle between good and evil and right and wrong, was like for Timothy McVeigh, uh, the thing he wanted to impress on us. And so like dramatic acts of street theater, like a kind of performance violence, these instances of terrorism that seem to us to be terrorism are meant to be very visible portrayals of a war that's very real in the mind of the people who are perpetrating them. They're not intended to do something. It's not after 9-11 suddenly boatloads of uh, jihadis were going to end up on the East Coast and started to take. No! The medium was the message. That was it. Look at it. There's a war going on. Get it? I mean, there's no need for a little creeper to come across your television screen and say, this terrorist act has been brought to you by so-and-so or for such-and-such. No, you don't need to see that. You just see war. And suddenly we were thinking, war. We bit the bait. Yeah, we said, okay. You, you think we're at war? All right, we'll buy into your message. And I'm saying, why are we buying into their message? <laughs> why don't we just find these guys and bring them? Why are we promoting their idea of the war on terror? This is nuts. But that's the stance that the American government did. The Muslim world in general was much smarter than us. They said, no, there's no war going on. We're not following these guys. We're not supporting them. They're crazy. 
which is appropriate attitude to take. But you see the point. This vision of cosmic war, this great battle, which every religious tradition has. You know, the country revivalists that so attracted me when I was a teenager in southern Illinois, that kind of war is in every religious tradition. Onward Christian soldier marching up. In every religious tradition. The Hindu, uh, Hinduism is full of good things. It's also peaceful. What about the Mahabharata and the Ramayana? Full of war, full of battles. Well, those Buddhists, fortunately, if you read the Mahavamsa, the Buddhist Chronicles in Sri Lanka, full of war. Every religious tradition has these, these images of warfare, of great battles, that can be easily resuscitated, brought to life, not only in a metaphorical sense, which they're intended to be. I mean, most Muslims will tell you the jihad is really talking about the internal struggle between good and evil, like in every religious tradition, sure. But there are people who then see this as a way of thinking about the struggles in the real world. And when that happens, and unlike the politicization of religion, which is what I expected to find with Binderwale, we see the religionization of politics, the implantation of religious metaphors of great struggle into the political landscape, into social struggles in the real world. And so you get this kind of image of warfare in such a dramatic way. You get an image of cosmic war on a global scale that uh, is, is intended to give us a sense of the drama, the reality of an imagined war in the minds of the people who perpetrated it, and which, as I say, sadly, we bought into it. So ever since 9-11, of course, this, by promoting the image of warfare, we've helped to, in fact, perpetuate and expand the terrorist acts that were began in those states. But the, this doesn't, this answers in a sense the question of why is it religion, religious? That is, you can understand the role that religion plays not just in ethically justifying violence, which it does, but also providing the images of warfare that provide the theater, the spectacle that makes violence uh, rational, sensible within that context. But what's the point? What, what, what is it aimed at? So I go back to Binder and Wally, back to the case of the Sikhs, Try to understand what's their beef, what's their thing? What are they trying to, who, who are they against? Are they against Hindus and Muslims? No, it turns out mostly it's the secular leaders of India. In a sense, their battle is a war with the secular state. Their battle is with westernization, with modernization, with globalization, with all of the things that kind of bring a different kind of social relationship and political relationship between individuals and the collectivities of which they're a part. And so for Binderwale and his community, he wanted to recreate a religious society, or create one, really, because it never existed even in the Sikh tradition. It was an imagined recreation of an imagined religious society that would somehow provide a buffer, an alternative to a more sensitive and sensible uh, characteristics of society would be an alternative to the homogenization of, uh, of, of the alienation of a globalized world. And so he holed himself up in the Golden Temple, which is the main, uh, which is the main uh, kind of uh, like the Vatican of, of Sikhs. Lovely, beautiful location. Not actually in the Golden Temple, but in the Akal Tak, which is uh, on the other side of this drawbridge within the lovely confines. And, it was there that Mrs. Gandhi puzzled about what to do. She was the prime minister at the time, and she was exasperated. She, thought, she said she had given these people everything. What did they want? Well, the point is they didn't want anything. And he, she didn't get the point that she was playing a role as the kind of satanic, evil person in an image and imagined kind of global cosmic war. How do you explain that to a political leader? Well, I'm sorry, it's not that they want something. You're playing a role as a satanic leader in a cosmic <laughs> war. You say, oh, that's nice. Well, what do I do? <laughs> and her generals tell her, uh, don't sweat it, India. We've got a plan. <laughs> Note to self. <laughs> You're in a situation of terrorism, and your generals tell you, don't sweat it. they got a plan. Don't take it. <laughs> 
because their plan was, oh, we'll tippy-toe into the precincts of the Golden Temple in the middle of the night, we'll bring in tanks and stuff like that, and we'll just bomb the hell out of the Kaltuk, and we'll destroy Bin and Wally, chop off the head of the snake, snake is gone, everything's over, right? How many times have you heard that solution posed by political and military leaders? Problem with terrorism, you have to fight fire with fire, and you have to cut off the head of the snake. Well, of course, that never works. When you fight fire with fire, you usually get more fire. <laughs> you cut off the head of a snake, several more grow. When the Israelis tried to kill the leader of Hamas, then the Hamas rose to power in a way that it never had before. And the same thing happened in the case of the Sikhs. They weren't successful at getting in in the middle of the night. It took longer than they thought. Bin Rawali had reinforcements in the back. They had a pitch struggle for about a week. A thousand innocent pilgrims were caught in between and were killed in the struggle. Eventually, Bin Rawali was killed. But it angers Sikhs around the world. And even people who had never taken an interest in this fight before were suddenly an enemy of Indira Gandhi, including her own bodyguards. Two Sikhs who pulled out weapons as she walked from her home to her office in the lovely gardens in New Delhi, assassinated her, left her bleeding on the, on the sidewalk. And then in response, thousands of Sikhs were killed. And the movement gained strength rather than being destroyed. So for the rest of the 1980s, the movement continued. We could talk about how it came to an end, which is an interesting story, but the point is that the battle was won in between the perceived enemy of the secular state. And this has been a common, common pattern around the world. When I, after I took this kind of thesis on the road, uh, there is, of course, the rise of a new uh, religious political party, the BJP, the party of the Jandata Party, which again is in power in India. Yes, it's like any other political party, but it also has a strong religious component, uh, just as uh, some aspects of American politics have strong religious components. There is a kind of religionization of politics that's happening globally, even in places like Sri Lanka. And you're saying, wait a second, Buddhists, everybody knows how nice Buddhists are. They're lovely people. Uh, they don't really, they don't believe in killing a thing. Except about a month ago in Colombo, there was a peace rally of Christians and, and Muslims and Buddhists and, and, and people of all different backgrounds. And they came around the corner and they were met by this angry group of monks that said, get out of here. If you want peace, go up to Jeff. And they had clubs, they started beating on them so much for so much for pleasant Buddhist monks. About two months ago, I was in Myanmar talking with this guy, uh, Wiratu, who was on the cover of Time magazine as, uh, with the heading, The Buddhist Face of Terror. Why? Because in Myanmar, former Bur Burma, as the country is now being transformed, he has conjured the fears of a Muslim takeover of the country. There are only 4% Muslims in Burma, I mean, almost none. But in his imagination, they're a huge threat, and um, he, we have to be warned about these things. And, and he's incited riots, and people have been killed, Muslims have been taken out of their homes and put on fire. Where have you heard about that before? But in this case, it's Buddhists putting Muslims on fire, killing them, taking them out of their homes, destroying mosques. The UN has proclaimed him as one of the most dangerous men in Asia, but when he looked at me, he smiled and he said, do I look like a terrorist? <laughs> and what I didn't tell him, I'd say, you know, all the terrorists I've talked with say they don't look like terrorists. <laughs> and you're one of them. Um, but in every culture, there is this kind of response to Mandarin. You know, the, Back in the 19, late 70s, this all began in a way with the Ayatollah Khomeini and a relatively bloodless coup in Iran, which, as you know, was against the Shah and against the transformations in Iran, but it was also about westernization or West toxification, as the Ayatollah called it, an inebriation of things Western. I remember being in Tehran and visiting friends of mine before the revolution, and he would take me out. On, uh, out of the town, and he said, you know, it was great. We would bar hop in Tehran until the middle of the night, and the music was great. And I said, to him, you know, this was like, we were both graduate students from Berkeley. I said, this was like San Francisco. And the Mullers came to Tehran, and they saw the bars that were open at 4 o'clock in the morning, and they said, this looks like San Francisco. And they didn't have the same intonation in their voice as we did. So it's understandable that after the revolution, they wanted to transform society and recreate a culture, or create a culture, 
an imagined religious society to counter the forces of globalization of change. And much the same thing happened in Afghanistan. No, no, this is not the Taliban. This is the Mujahideen, an earlier attempt to try to purge Afghanistan of foreign influences, in this case, Soviet, with Soviet secularism. Now, at that time, in the 1980s, we, the United States, thought this was just great because, after all, we were fighting those godless commies, and uh, the Soviets were supporting the socialist government in, in Afghanistan. You know, if we had not overthrown it, it probably would have, Afghanistan would be like many of the other Central Asian states today. But no, we wanted to get in and fight the communists, so we supported the Mujahideen. There's a picture of Zbigniew Brzezinski, again, Jimmy Carter's national security advisor, standing up on a tank. Ted Turner has this in this Cold War series, shouting out at the Mujahideen, saying, fight on, fight on for Allah. Now, can you imagine Condoleezza Rice or Hillary Clinton <laughs> saying to the Taliban, fight on, fight on. No, <laughs> because the godless commies are gone, we have now a whole new cast of characters, no longer the Mujahideen. There are these guys, the Taliban, and they're no longer fighting against the, uh, the evil influences of secular Soviets. They're fighting against the evil influences of secular United States. And they see us not as the uh, guys are coming to rescue Afghanistan from terrorists. They see us as the guys are coming to try to make Afghanistan into a little America, and they don't want that. So the Taliban, after initially being upset, is now gaining in strength in Afghanistan, and not just Afghanistan. Uh, where, where is no, no doubt it will become the dominant player uh, once the Americans leave later this year, but also across the border in Pakistan, where there was never a Taliban before, that is before the U.S. invasion of Afghanistan, but has become a major force, particularly along the Pathan sections of Baluchistan and western, uh, western uh, uh, Pakistan, which threatened the Pakistani leaders as well as Americans. It's become a major problem, and it's been a major problem with U.S. relationships with Pakistan, where now U.S. America, which used to be warmly greeted and loved in Pakistan. I used to love going to Pakistan when I lived in, in Punjab in India, right across the border. Now the U.S. is regarded as a major threat to peace in Pakistan. There's a Pew survey that showed over 50% of people thought that the U.S. was the main enemy of Pakistan. Only 15% identified India, their traditional threat, and only 7% said the Taliban, which were the group that we're there supposedly to save the Pakistanis and the Afghan people from. You see the problem. I'm not saying it's an easy job to, for Americans to extricate themselves. I, don't, I know Obama's trying to do that. I, it, it, it's, but you see the problem. You see the problem because the larger issue is the way in which religion has become fused with politics as a protest against the secularist forces of secularization in a globalized society. And that's happening everywhere. In Egypt, for example, the Muslim Brotherhood, which was a fairly small group, uh, you know, with, uh, uh, um, when, it was, when it was created, uh, relying on, on uh, images of, and, and uh, theoretical uh, positions of, of um, Said Qutb and others, but when Hassan al-Banna uh, al uh, created it, it was not a major force, not like it's become uh, in contemporary Egyptian society today. So strong that it, for a while, of course, it became the major, it be formed the p uh, political uh, uh, party, the leadership uh, after the Tahrir Square revolution until, of course, the military government uh, took over and they're ruling now directly, but it became, it has a, an example of, a Middle Eastern example of the force of religious politics. When it was adopted across the border within Palestine. Now this is a very interesting situation because the Palestinian movement had been largely secular up until around 1990. And you're saying, wait a second, wait a second, we hear all the time, we hear all the time in the, in the press that the hatred of Muslims and Jews go back for centuries and centuries. How do you expect to solve anything in the region because they hate each other and have been fighting each other for, 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 for centuries they've been fighting? No, they haven't. Who told you that? No, they haven't. Muslims and Jews have lived peacefully together for most of world history. When, the, when Spain was a Muslim country, Jews lived there happily until the Christians came over and, and then the Inquisition, then the Jews had trouble. But, 
No, they haven't. And even in the case of Israel and Palestine, yes, of course, it's a territorial issue because the Palestinians feel like they've been taken from their land. But their struggle, led by, by, by Yasser Arafat, was a largely secular one. He was a very much a secularist. He's a Muslim, of course. His wife wasn't. She was a Christian, a Palestinian Christian. But it was a secular movement. And the same is true on the other side. On this, Israel was established to be a secular state. Uh, you know, it would provide a homeland for Jews, but not to be, as Netanyahu says, uh, in a, a Jewish state. It was supposed to be a secular state. And the first flag for Israel had seven stars, which were to symbolize the seven hours of a working class day. It was to be a kind of socialist image of a secular society that would, of course, be a homeland for Jews, especially after the Holocaust, where understandably <coughs> the need grew for it. But it, 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 it wasn't until after the, the 67 war and an increased uh, pressure of the settlers and a whole new kind of religious politics in Israel that religionized Israel's politics. So you have only in recent 20 years or so, 25 years, the religionization of what had been a secular political struggle. So this guy, Sheikh Yassin, rose to prominence in this frustration that nothing was happening in the movement led by Yasser Arafat. So when I interviewed him, you can see this is a while ago in the early 1990s when we both look a little bit different. I had much darker hair and he was much more alive <laughs> because he's <laughs> since been killed by an Israeli missile strike. Uh, he suffered from a debilitating kind of nerve d d disease and when I, Talk with uh, Sheikh Hussein, this is the beginning of the Hamas movement. He was saying Palestine would not be free until it's an Islamic Palestine. That was a radical thing to say because Arafat was leading a secular movement largely. Now the interesting thing for me was he said this just the day after I talked with this guy. This guy is Meir Kahani, a, a rabbi from Brooklyn. He's living in Jerusalem, leading a strident anti-Muslim movement in Israel, trying to religionize Israel's politics, frustrated with the fact that Israel was a secular, secular country. He thought, that, he thought that Israel should realize its biblical heritage of recreating biblical society, recreating the Temple and Temple Mount, which means that you had to take over the West Bank because this is where all places are in the Bible, Jericho, you know, all the places you read about. So you had to recreate biblical Israel in order for the create the conditions for the Messiah to come. I mean, how awesome is that? Here you're, you're meddling with global history. So he wanted to he wanted to Israel to be biblical Israel. So interestingly, you see the dynamics between two extremist leaders with their kind of religious visions of a politics that up to that day had been largely secular. And both the Palestinian movement and Israeli politics have been bedeviled by these two positions ever since. So the religionization of the politics is a very recent thing and a new project that has taken place in the region. This is my picture. Of, uh, of a rally in Sheridan Hotel in, in, um, in Jerusalem, where that's Mayor Kahane, only about six months before he was killed. And actually, the guy I interviewed later, Mahmoud Alim, uh, Abu Lima in Lompoc, was a, 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 a complicit in the assassination of Mayor Kahane. It's just interesting how all these connections come about. But after Kahane, after Kahane was killed in downtown Manhattan, this guy, Yigal Amir, a seminary student in Israel, decided that. He couldn't take it anymore. He had to stop what he thought was, uh, what he said was a train going amok. And he pulled out this gun and aimed at this guy, Yitzhak Rabin, the prime minister of Israel, because of this picture. Shaking hands with a Palestinian in the Rose Garden with, with Bill Clinton smiling behind. Ah, this showed that he was going to give away the West Bank. He was going to give away biblical Israel and he couldn't take it anymore. So he took out his gun and he shot Rabin. And these are young Israelis, you know, crying, you know, weeping. I took this picture of the memorial that's been made in, in, in um, Tel Aviv, right by that public square where uh, Yitzhak Rabin gave his last, uh, his last talk. And I talked with his widow uh, who, who told me, you know, she said, we never expected that, he, that Yitzhak Rabin was going to be killed, would be killed, it was in danger by Jew. We thought so maybe some Muslim activists but we never expected a Jew 
would want to do this. They did because you know, they, they, following Mayor Kahane, saw that he was upsetting their vision of a religious Israel. So Iraq poses that whole interesting set of new dynamics which continue to unravel today. So after the American invasion uh, of Iraq, within six months or so, I was in Baghdad. I always go where things are blowing up to try to understand the religionization of the insurgency, the resistance to American occupation. Now, you can understand why any people would be not like to be occupied, but why was this religionized in a certain way? This is me talking with, with the, my colleague, Mary Calder from London School of Economics. She and I were there as part of a group looking at the humanitarian transformation after a time of conflict as guests of a, a women's uh, rights uh, uh, NGO and Baghdad University. Uh, and the woman on our right, on the right part of the screen is our translator. And the guy in the middle is a, a, a mullah who is an imam who is the head of the Association of Muslim Clerics of Al-Anbar region. This is the Sunni area of Western Iraq. And he, he tried to explain to me that what was frustrating about he tried to explain to me why he thought the Americans had taken over Iraq. He said, Don't, it had nothing to do with oil, it had nothing to do with weapons of mass destruction. He said, he, he thought it was because the Americans saw Saddam Hussein as being weak. And he was about to fall to a Muslim revolution to create a, a Muslim state in Iraq. And that's what the Americans didn't want. And I said, what a nutty conspiracy theory. And I started talking around Baghdad to other people, Japanese journalists. Oh, yeah, we believe that. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. That's what Americans are afraid of, is Muslim politics. Well, at the time, it seemed crazy. Now, maybe it seems less crazy. Because, and it also explains why the Sunnis in Western Iraq were susceptible to radicalization. Now, this is a map of Iraq shows that the Shia, you know, there are Shia and Sunni, two kinds of Muslims. The Shia are in the eastern part close to Iran. They're Arabs. They're not Persian, but they're Arabs, but they're Sunnis. It's Shia, excuse me. The light, <laughs> light beige is, is Shia. They're majority, about 60%. The kind of yellowest of the, the left, they're Sunnis, uh, also Muslims, but Sunnis, and some 20%. And then the north is another 20% and they're Kurds, a different ethnic community, Sunnis also, but a different ethnic community. So we're focusing on the Sunnis of Western Iraq over there. They're the ones who felt, feel really worried about the ouster of Saddam Hussein because now they're suddenly the minority. They're only 20%. They're afraid that the Shia will take over and just totally cut them out of any kind of political life. Well, the Americans very smartly realized they had a problem. Because this group became more and more radical against both the Americans and against the Shia, this guy, Zarkari, came in from Jordan and led a whole new movement he called Al-Qaeda in Iraq that then mobilized the Sunnis against the Americans and the Shia, both. And obviously something had to be done about him. He was, he was killed, the US, uh, but before he could, they had adopted a whole series of radical measures uh, be, public beheadings. Does this look familiar? This is Al Qaeda in Iraq, you know, some over 10 years ago. And you're saying, what, 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 but this doesn't have anything to do with the current ISIS, right? Al Baghdadi is the leader of ISIS, was the number three guy in Al Qaeda in Iraq. So after Zakari gets killed by the American forces, and we, we had to show his head to actually prove that he was killed. After he was killed, then somebody else comes in charge. He was killed, and then al Baghdadi takes over. But by the time al Baghdadi takes over as leader of al Qaeda in Iraq, something else had happened because of this guy, General Petraeus, and a whole new idea, which President Bush announces on TV. They're going to have what is called the surge, which really wasn't a surge. Yeah, it was an increase of troops in Baghdad, but what really happened was the troops came out of Al Anbar province, so the Americans were no longer a kind of visible symbol. And, and troop and military support and money was given to the Sunni leaders so they themselves could fight against Al Qaeda in Iraq. They themselves could resist Zakari's forces, which they did. 
and they destroyed al-Qaeda in Iraq. And you're saying, great, well that solves that problem, right? Um, yeah, as long as the Americans are there and it continues to support the awakening movement, but the Americans left. And when the Americans <coughs> left, they left this guy in charge. His name is al-Maliki. This may seem like a lousy picture of you, but it's my picture. I interviewed the guy when I was there and back in, you know, right after. I, I didn't, you know, I wanted to talk with a, with a Shia leader, and I was disappointed I didn't get to talk with anybody important. This guy was the office manager of, they wasn't even in charge of the Dawa party. He was just the off, and the Dawa party is like the number two Shia party, not even the main one. He was the office manager in an old uh, abandoned uh, airport terminus in Baghdad. And kind of sleepy, one of the worst interviews I've ever had. Kind of sleepy, didn't really have anything important to say. That's why they selected him to be prime minister. <laughs> because everybody thought, oh, you know, he's not going to, he's kind of a nebby. She's not going to fight for anything. Nobody, everybody gets along with him. Uh, he'll just be a temporary transition. And pa, he was smarter than they thought. And he shored up his power by pandering to his own community, his own Shia community, which meant that the Sunnis, the thing that they feared happened. Once again, they are ousted from power. Once again, they have no role whatsoever within the Iraqi government. They are treated like dirt. Now something else is happening in the region, that's next door in Syria, where the Sunnis over there are feeling the same thing. Now in Syria, they're the majority. But the leader, Hassan uh, uh, Assad in, in uh, Syria, is a kind of Shia, he's an Alawite, which is a kind of Shia. So there, it's again the story the Shias are controlling and keeping the Sunnis out. So you have these two regions that have a lot in common. So al-Baghdadi, pretty smart guy, he picks up on this and he says, aha, we got a rebellion of Sunnis in Syria, we got a rebellion of Sunnis in Iraq, I can do something with that. This is al-Baghdadi, when he, for a while he was a prisoner of the U.S. forces and when he was part of al-Qaeda in Iraq, and then they let him go because he wasn't, you know, they figured he was not important, which he wasn't then. But then he became that, <laughs> the guy on the right, the little bit changed image, uh, and declares himself the caliph, and leads a movement that, first of all, fights with an uh, al-Qaeda force within Syria. So the, the Zawari, the, uh, who after Osama bin Laden is the leader of al-Qaeda in and, and Afghanistan, says, wait a second, you know, you guys should get along. You should negotiate with each other. And Baghdadi says, nuts to that. <laughs> I'm just going to destroy al-Nusra, which is the al-Qaeda movement in, in, in Syria, which he did. And, and, and hated al-Qaeda ever since, and dropped the al-Qaeda name, and just called himself the uh, Islamic State. So that's where the Islamic State comes from. It's the old al-Qaeda in Iraq, al-Baghdadi, the same guy who was part of Zakari's forces, they're now dropping the name al-Qaeda because he got in a fight with Sawari. Same tactic, remember the beheadings? Yep, they're back again, they're back again. It's a government run by terror. It, uh, terror in, uh, to intimidate us, his enemies, but also intimidate his own people. Most of the bag beheadings you don't know about because they're carried out on Mosul against them, just people within leaders of the community who dare to challenge him. And, and they quit very quickly, this may look like a spider web because it's mostly desert in those regions and it follows the, 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 the lines of um, traffic where there are in fact cities. They have taken over most of eastern Syria and western Iraq. So you now have an actual control of a population. Now this Islamic state, is it Islamic, is it a state? You can say no to either one, but they do control territory and they do empower with a kind of Islamic ideology which masks a grab for power. Yeah, it is a religious ideology, but behind the violence, behind the killings, there is an attempt to gain control, an attempt to try to control not just for the purposes of an ideology, but for specific people. Now, who are the supporters of ISIS? One is these guys, those ordinary Sunnis in Al Anbar province, the western part of Iraq, who remember were being pushed out of power, and then they got rid of Al Qaeda, but then Al Maliki distanced them. So old leaders of the Ba'ath Party, old leaders of uh, uh, Saddam Hussein's militia, they're now given a role. They're now given a power. Mosul, the second largest city in, in Iraq, which is now controlled by ISIS, really runs pretty well. 
because these old administrators are now in charge. Now these old administrators, al-Baghdadi knows, are very fickle people. They fought against al-Qaeda once, but they followed al-Qaeda and then they fought against him because of General Petraeus. He knows that he needs to keep them in check. He knows that they could easily turn against him. What can he do to keep them in check? Aha, he brings in these guys. Crazy Western kids. And you're thinking to yourself, I'm thinking, why does he even want these people? They're lousy soldiers. I mean, they got no discipline. They just want to come and kill me, bottle them, big, big war, big fight. They have got, they're not beholden to anybody except him. Yes, exactly. You got it. <laughs> Perfect for his purposes. What's his purpose? To intimidate those other people. Those, uh, those uh, other supporters, make sure they don't stray. Make sure they don't, the same thing doesn't happen what happened previously after the awakening. He wants to, he wants to scare the crap out of them to make sure nothing, that they won't change their mind. So these poor people are recruited from all over the place, including this guy. By the way, uh, just this morning, they've identified the name of, of this, uh, the, the guy who's been into central figure in the beheadings. It's a, a kid who grew up, it was a college student in England, uh, Westminster um, uh, uh, University, uh, computer science. He was a gamer. He liked video games. Uh, wanted to go to Kuwait uh, to, for his career. That didn't work out. Uh, never really made it to computer, but, but he now lives out a computer game. He lives out World of Warcraft 3 or whatever it is on steroids uh, by this great jihadi war. We can not only imagine behead somebody like you do with a video game, you actually really do it. So he's carrying out his, uh, as many other Western kids are, their kind of romantic fantasies of what warfare is really like, not realizing in many cases they're simply cannon fodder. Baghdad just lines them up, a dozen of them, sends them in, suicide attack. He just enormously callous about the way in which he uses these young people. It's a tragedy. It's a real tragedy. But there they are. And Iran holds the secret. Because if suddenly Baghdad and Damascus were more open to Sunni politics, the support for Islamic State, ISIS, would crumble like a house of cards. Because these crazy Westerners are not a sufficient to really hold together any kind of army or state. You need those reliable people who are the ones who will easily turn again, already are turning against uh, al-Baghdadi uh, in Mosul and other parts of uh, Anbar province. So let me just finish up by saying, trying to capture all of this. What do they all have in common? As I said, there is a I've argued a kind of new Cold War between the religious politics and the secular state, uh, an attitude of mistrust and part generated by globalization and the feeling that the world is changing in ways that cannot be easily controlled. And the role of religion is one of uh, seeing the world in cosmic battles, the great uh, endless turmoil. But there's also another dimension to it, and that's a moral dimension to the whole critique because it taps into a sensibility that we we'll all share, and that is a sense that in an era of globalization, we're just being made into numbers. We no longer have that sense of social identity and the clarity about who we are as a people and where we come from and where we go. And, and so in that context, this, the, the secular state is seen not as a champion of freedom the way the Enlightenment imagined it, but as a kind of project for consumer advocacy to make us into uh, franchise numbers, another unit in the Google search for uh, different kinds of uh, possible marketing attacks, you know, that's, there, there is, you can understand the appeal uh, of trying to reclaim a sense of personal and spiritual identity in a world that seems aimed at trying to make us uh, devoid of them. In the era of a global, globalization, there are really three big issues. One is identity, who are we? One is accountability, Who, who's really in charge <laughs> you know, when everything can be made, everything, everywhere. Uh, and how can we really be secure? And religion provides answers to each one of those. It gives us a sense of identity. We know who we are if we're part of a particular religious community. We know who's in charge if we have a, have a tradition of faith and a tradition of leadership and a tradition of laws. We know that there's a 
safe harbor, a community that will welcome us. So it's understandable that in this global transformation in a time that we are buffeted by the seas of change, that the safe harbor of religion would be appealing. So it is true that it is be, it, 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 religion becomes a part of the destructive and dangerous uh, uh, aspects of human existence in this time, its return to public life in existence, in, in vengeance. Uh, religion is a part of the harm of, of public life, but it's also a part of the hope uh, because the moral critique gives us a sense of how we might redeem ourselves in the future. You've been very patient. I appreciate the conversation. I hope we have time for a couple questions uh, before we go to lunch. Yes, so first let's give a warm round of applause. Wonderful, really wonderful. Um, so we do have time for some questions. Uh, and when you're done with the questions, don't run away because we're feeding all of you, right? And so Dr. Stewart is actually getting the food right now. It's, Egyp it's Egyptian Saudi food. It will be arriving soon. So uh, don't leave. So I will let you choose uh, who, who you want to call on. So remember, you honor the speaker by asking questions, OK? So uh, make sure to honor the speaker. Ask a lot of questions, please. Can we turn Go some ahead. lights on? Yeah, why don't we turn on the lights? I'm afraid now you'll be able to see what I look like. Yeah, I think if you move away from this, maybe it, maybe it helps. Like oh, if you move okay. Away, that might help. Sure. Okay. Not sure if that does it, but it's Comments, questions? The speaker is being dishonored. Yes, please. <laughs> Oh, think of a computer game <laughs> in religious terms, a grand conflict that are, is kind of imagined uh, between the forces of good and forces of evil. Uh, it's just as simple as that, and every religious tradition is full of it. So is literature, so is computer games, so is nationalism. You know, after 9-11, the, the war and terror kind of evoked the same kind of grand, either with us or against us, you know, we're fighting for Christendom, we're fighting for all of the good things in life. Every, Every war, to an extent, has an uh, image as a cosmic war behind it. But uh, the cosmic war can be imagined without actually being real, uh, and, and it can be a part of a motivating force for all, all sorts of things, for good as well as for ill. Yes? When you, oh, sorry, when you interviewed, um, oh, sorry, when you interviewed some of these individuals, did you get a sense of maybe they had some kind of mental disorder or any kind of, like, maybe... Um, Associative. No, not really. I didn't interview anybody I thought was like, you know, psychopathically crazy. Uh, even Mahmoud Abulima, who has a whole string of blood behind him, he's, you know, been involved in a whole series of merging. Yet he, as you, as I, I, as I talked about him, he's a very affable guy, you know, friendly and gregarious and, and uh, eager to charm me. I mean, in every case, these are people who were interested in talking to me, just as I was interested in talking with them. Uh, because they had a message to get out, a story to get. And now you're saying, well, they tailored their, their story to you. Well, of course, but that's okay. That's what I was trying to understand. How, what is this tailored story? I try to understand that. It tells me a lot about them. Obviously, I've done my research. I know more about them, and I know the ugly sides and the sides that they don't want to sh uh, share. Uh, but I did you know, they're megalomaniacs, of course, like Vuatu, the Buddhist monk I just recently interviewed in Burma. Uh, they're, they're grandstanders. Uh, they, you know, they crave attention. Um, but public leadership is full of people like that. <laughs> Usually they run for office, <laughs> you know, or they become, you know, celebrity ministers or, <laughs> or you know, star professors or <laughs> you know, something like that. Uh, so... I, I'm not a big, maybe it's because I'm a sociologist and I, not a psychologist, but I'm not, I, I have yet to see a kind of terrorist uh, psychological pattern, although I know people try to do that. Yeah, I, I, mean, I study trauma. Pardon? I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a licensed clinical social worker, oh, sure. so I do mm -hmm. a lot of trauma work. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it seems like there's a lot of dissociation going on. There's a lot of derealization. I mean, the, the world around them is not as... Um, it's, it, they don't see the real parts of the world. You're absolutely right, but doesn't warfare do that to everybody? Yeah, it's actually 
I mean, if you're a soldier and you're fighting, you know, American sniper, uh, you know, most popular here. Here I'm watching the Selma thing. This is one of the greatest movies. Of the, and, and, and the theater watch, to watch Selma was empty. Everybody was flocking to see American Sniper. Why? Well, because you're, you're seeing somebody who had disassociated himself from beginning with a kid <laughs> that he has to kill because he thinks he's part of a grand and great war. That's the great thing, I mean, from a strategic point of view, about cosmic war. Yeah. It does other other people. It does alienate you. I, I, can, I, can, I can't kill you if I know you uh, or, or I think you are somebody. But if I think you are uh, you know, an enemy of, a, of a satanic agent, oh, no problem. You know, I could dispatch with you in a second. So you, you, it provides a very useful service in, for somebody like al-Baghdadi who wants to build his power on the basis of just killing people, or Boko Haram. Again, it's a movement of political power. These are movements of political power. You say, oh, it shows a crazy Muslim doing crazy. No, it doesn't. It shows that crazy people are trying to gain power and they're using a religious basis for you know, mobilizing people and justifying killing. It happens in every tradition. Pardon? There's a lot of learned trauma. Learned trauma. Is it, these are, See, I, I don't know that. What does that mean? Are, I mean, these are people who aren't maybe, you know, so, so you're a young kid, and somebody comes in and says, you know, there's all this, these people want to do harm to you, this is happening. So there's things that, that aren't actually directly happening to this person. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah, but they are. Yeah, it, actually, I'll try to remember that phrase, learned trauma. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because that's absolutely true. It's a way of kind of taking on, you know, the community is, uh, you know, the, the suffering of a community onto yourself, and even though you may not have experienced, you can, on behalf of your community, you can do this. The, the, the Charlie Hebdo uh, uh, incident is a good example of that uh, in, in Paris, where these two guys, uh, Algerian immigrants, and the, everybody said, oh, they're Algerian Muslims. They're Muslims. Wait a second, back up. They're Algerians. They are part of a minority community that are dist in France. Don't you think there's a problem there? <laughs> you know, we've got a sense of alienation that they take upon themselves, the sense of humiliation that their community feels as a way of trying to embolden and empower them, kind of losers, a couple of guys that have never made it in society. They're not particularly religious, but they're not particularly anything. That's the problem. They, 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 they don't, so, but they think, ah, we can go out in a blaze of glory. We can show our community that we're standing up for them. Their you know, sense of humiliation by going into this uh, offices of this uh, political satire magazine and kill everybody. So it's exactly what you're talking about. They are kind of adopting uh, the humiliation of the community as a way of, you know, emboldening themselves. You know, finally, we are big stuff. Finally, we're somebody. Everybody thought we were nothing. Well, we'll show them. We're somebody. You know, it's like the, you know, the two, two brothers are involved in the Boston uh, Marathon bombing again, uh, particularly the older brother, a kind of loser. And uh, drug is younger brother into this sense of we'll take upon ourselves a cause so that we can go out in a blaze of glory. It's exactly what you're talking about. Yeah? Uh, I'm wondering how much we know about these recruits that are, uh, you know, after they get there, uh, that are recruited from more privileged environments and certainly come countries that are <laughs> very unlike the country they're going to. Um, uh, and, I, and are they different? Or do you think the experience will be different or similar to, let's say, recruits who were recruited, people who were attracted by the ideology of, you know, the Sandinista revolution or other revolutions. It just seems like, in that case, they had more chances to kind of ease into it. Right. Sometimes we're set. No, you're absolutely right. So, some of these kids are just stunned that they're, <laughs> they're suddenly cannon, cannon fodder. And, you know, this is not really what they imagined they were going to be doing. So uh, several of them now have come crawling back to like the UK. But it's a real problem, it's risky. First of all, if they know that they're going AWOL uh, you know, in Iraq, they're gonna kill them. They're gonna, they'll behead them before they get out of, the, out of the country. So just getting out is a huge problem. And then staying alive <laughs> because now they're targeted. Uh, you know, they're, they're worse, they're, you know, they betray the, the faith. But, but you're absolutely right that, that, that people like this have told about w what, what life is like, which is, which is pretty awful. I mean, for, it's like for a lot of soldiers, a lot of them are just standing around waiting for something to happen. You know, and it's, it's boring and nobody knows who's in charge because it's not well organized, especially these, these young people. They're not disciplined. They don't know the language. They're, you know, they're basically just being kept around so, until they can use them as suicide attackers. 
It's just horrible. Uh, and some of them actually catch on. Hey, this is, <laughs> wait a second, I thought I was going to be like in a video game, running around and, and waving a sword and everything. Uh, but by that time, how do they get out? It's a real problem. Yeah, yeah. Well, these three women this last week, this weekend, who were promises mm. of fridges and microwaves and yeah, yeah. shake machines, and I just can't visualize these houses. They're used. They're used as concubines. Uh, unfortunately, I mean, I hate to say it, but they they they're they're they're, they're abused. I know. Yeah. Sohela has a question there, and then we we actually have the food already here. So Sohela, and then you can. Oh, and then of course Dr. Karenga, and then and then we will stop. Okay. Okay. Last and two questions. Go ahead. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Do you mind if I come around and? Sure. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Do you, in your opinion, do you think a model like that could ever be achieved again? Like, well, where people can live together in peace, peace and harmony with each other? Hey, hey. It's called Long Beach. It's called Long Beach. I mean, yes, I mean, of course. <laughs> oh, sure. I mean, yeah, and that's, of course, one of the tragedies where all communities like the Yazidis, you know, suddenly are uprooted and, and are the cops in Egypt and they feel like they no longer have a place again. That's one of the really horrible things about this kind of tribalization that, that makes any minority community feel um, n not w welcome. But uh, you know, my hope is that this is a temporary moment in social transformation. Now, I, I don't know what's going to happen, what, what will happen after the nation state, but I think that's part of what's going on, that the nation state is a, as an artifact, nationalism, it, which after all has only been around since the uh, middle of the 20th century, less than 100 years. So it's not very long in world history. Uh, and clearly we're transitioning, transitioning into something else, you know, maybe something like the EU, where even you know, Europe, which created nationalism, now is as a transnational community of the EU. So I mean, maybe that's a model, uh, maybe a kind of transnational global society, uh, maybe new empires. I mean, most of the world history, places, uh, regions have been controlled by empires that allow for a great deal of variety within them. Empires are actually a pretty cool way of <laughs> running society because it's, they're only interested in power. They're not trying to make everybody homogenous in the same the way in which uh, nationalism does, this enlightenment concept that we thought was so great, but that really privileges uh, ethnic communities in, in dominant roles. So I'm kind of optimistic um, because by nature I'm an optimist <laughs> that things will get better and, and, and in the meantime we should be happy that we live in Long Beach. <laughs> yes, yes sir. Yeah. First of all, thanks very much for the yeah. lecture and for the work that you do yeah. and I appreciate it. There's a complexity here that I'm concerned about and I'm sorry the lady left because she tends to psychologize what are actually sometimes very strong political uh, interests and compelling interests mm -hmm. of the people. And there's no empathy for the people who struggle for self-determination. Mm -hmm. People can actually commit, as the United States does, terror and still be considered fighting for uh, real aims. So what I would like for you to do is speak to, as you do in your writing so mm -hmm. well, the face that a lot of these people are very normal people. Oh, that yes. They have actual <laughs> political aims and they're not like crazy mm -hmm. or suffering from some kind of trauma mm -hmm. or actually taking on a false. If, if I feel for my whole people. Mm -hmm. I think Jews do too. Mm -hmm. I don't see why I would have to justify feeling for African people mm -hmm. uh, in their suffering and fight for them, mm -hmm. even though I haven't suffered what they did, mm -hmm. right? So I, the complexity you do in your work mm -hmm. If you could just speak to that, I'd appreciate it. No, no, you, 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 just, you just did very eloquently, but, but uh, I can give you, a, for instance, in the case of uh, ISIS, mm -hmm. uh, well, yeah, special Baghdadi case. is pretty megalomania. Not that. But, but I'm the... I'm talking about liberation movement. But, but in a sense, that is a liberation movement. You know, all of these uh, ordinary Sunni Iraqis who felt marginalized by the Shia government, they flock to support ISIS because it empowers them. And my solution to the problem is empower them. Say, all right, you do have a righteous cause. You do have a reason for complaint. You should have a political voice. And you have to change the government in Baghdad in order to 
allow them to have that voice. And Obama, by the way, made exactly that point. He said, we're not sending any kind of support into Iraq unless you change the government and make things more open. Al Maliki's been kicked out. That's right. He's now been, been changed, in part because of U.S. pressure. So I think a president is playing exactly the, exactly the same role, seeing that there is a just demand behind we're this crazy. We're out of time, but when we come back for that seven, it's, I want to make a distinction between that internal struggle, things like occupation, invasion, conquest. We never talk about that. And mm -hmm. so we just talk about people just bombing, like when they just felt bad and bombed. Mm -hmm. The reality is there's a struggle going on. Mm -hmm. And there's a struggle of compelling interest that people have for freedom and justice. So I know you say it in your book, but we don't have as much time here. But and you, and you said it very eloquently, so I'll let you have the last word. <laughs> <laughs>